Hey everybody, welcome back. So I was doing a quick little study earlier today about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and just a perspective on it. Not necessarily a Bible study, just Eli's perspective um, on that. Just a thought to consider and relate to your life right now. But what I was talking about earlier is that we ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil back in the Garden of Eden. That was the original sin. I was suggesting that it wasn't necessarily the actual fruit, that when we ate the fruit, we had this new spiritual consciousness or awareness. What I'm thinking is, it was more just the act of doing it was the the sin that brought us the knowledge of good and evil because we committed evil. And that's how we now knew it in our lives because we were experientially living it out. That being the case, what I wanted to talk about is that Jesus himself did say, and we see this in the book of Mark, I think in the book of Matthew as well, but certainly in the gospel of Mark, he says it is not what you consume that defiles you, but rather it's what comes from your heart that brings defilement, anger, lust, right? All these lusts of the passion, jealousy, these are the things that defile us or make us unclean. Whoops, i got to get my notes right in front of me. So I'm not trying to use that to like prove what I'm saying. I'm just saying even Jesus himself did say it has nothing to do with what you're eating. It's what comes out of us. And therefore, when we ate that fruit in the Garden of Eden, what came out of our heart was the lust for the knowledge and the lust for the tastefulness of the food, it was attractive and it looked good for eating. And we knew we would have some knowledge that God was holding out on us, quote unquote. This is what I want to say. I'm currently going through the book of Job. And in the book of Job, if you read carefully, it's not that Satan goes to God and says, let me torment Job because you have a hedge of protection around him. God is the one who initiates the conversation twice. He tells Satan, where have you been? And Satan says, I've been roaming the earth and walking on it, basically like a roaring lion seeking whoever he can devour. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? He initiated the testing and then Satan said, yeah, well, of course he's a righteous man. Of course he's faithful to you. Of course there is no one like him with his integrity because you have a hedge of protection around him. He said, you have given him all this wealth and you're protecting him. Of course he's not going to curse you. And then Satan says, but let me take away everything he owns. He, he wipes out his family, his houses, his livestock. The guy was a rich man. He had 30,000 camels, 7,000 you know, female donkeys. He had all these this wealth at that time wealth was livestock it was it was agriculture it was servants right he was the one of the wealthiest guys and a righteous man he was found righteous a man of integrity is what the bible says but god knew that if he said have you considered my servant job that satan would say let me test him and he will curse you to your face well job didn't he said naked i came into this world naked i will go and then Satan went back and Satan didn't approach God and say, look at Job. He didn't curse you. Let me go further. That's not what happened. What happened is Satan approached God. God said, where have you been? The same conversation. And Satan said, I've been roaming the earth, walking on it. And then God, a second time, said, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him. He has found a man of integrity and faithfulness. Even after you took those things away from him, he didn't curse me. God was almost goading Satan, right? And he like then said, look, it didn't work. He's still faithful to me. Now Satan again says, okay, a man will give up everything he has for his life. Let me torment him physically. And God says, okay, you can have him, but don't kill him. So a whole nother side series of that is that we see how Satan needs God's permission to do anything. Satan does not have authority over your life. God does. But the point here is, God tested Job through Satan's ego two times. And the point is, Job remained faithful to the end. And at the end, he got everything back double. He got blessed beyond measure. But his three friends were over there telling him, you must have done something wrong. We're very religious and we know that if you're being punished, you must have done something wrong. And Job's like, I didn't do anything. Job didn't know that 
God was orchestrating the whole thing while Satan was the one doing the tormenting. He didn't know any of that heavenly stuff, any of that spiritual. He did not know. But he stayed faithful to the end. His wife even told him he was over scraping his boils off of his face and his body over in the ash pile in the heap using a broken clay pottery, right? A broken uh, clay plate to scrape off the boils. His wife even said, why don't you curse God and just die? Like that, just do that, just die. And Job didn't. But at the end of the story, he said, I heard about you, God. I've, I've heard this reputation, but now I've seen it with my own eyes. I've experienced you. And I know now to fear you and respect you. He said, I have experienced it. And the whole story is about humility. The whole story is about humbling ourselves before God. And when the test comes, we follow faithfully through the testing. Things are not always going to be sunshine and butterflies. There's going to be tribulations. Jesus said it himself in John 16, 33. There will be many... He said, I've told you all these things. He did a huge, huge conversation with the disciples over the, the Passover dinner, the, the, the Last Supper, as people commonly call it. You know, he walking through the, the Garden of Gethsemane, talking about being the true vine, giving this whole thing. And he said, I've told you all these things so that, so that in me, you may have joy and joy abundant. And he said, for I, there will be many trials and tribulations in this world, but take heart for I have overcome the world in Jesus. Through Jesus, we find that solace and that comfort to activate our faith and to walk through the testing. But here in the Garden of Eden, we didn't do that. We didn't have that. All that Eve had, she was defenseless, really. All that she had was Adam, and we're not sure where Adam was. Adam didn't stop anything. Was he there? Was he not? I don't know. But he certainly didn't stop this. Eve was defenseless, man, and Satan is dirty and terrible. He like a rabbit. She was like a little bunny rabbit, and he was like a devourous wolf who was just trying to trick her, and she just fell right into it. And it, it, you know that's who Satan is. But listen, through Jesus, we have authority and power over even Satan. We don't have to let fear rule over as we're going through challenging situations. It's it just is not worth it. Have faith. Take faith. Know who has your back. Know who's protecting you. But also, consider the story of Job and understand that God may be orchestrating this. I'm not saying he is, and I'm not saying God has your calamity in mind for you. What I am saying is, God may very well be orchestrating the torment that's happening in your life right now because he's testing your faith. And he wants to know, are you really living for him? Do you really believe that he's the creator of all things? Do you really believe that God has your best interests in mind? Do you really believe he's capable of doing anything and taking you out of any situation? I am not a health, wealth, and prosperity person. That's not who I am. I'm not going to tell you that. What I am going to tell you is God is able. If he chooses, he can. And look at the book of Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They were going to get thrown into the fiery furnace, burning seven times hotter than usual. The guys who set the furnace died because it was so hot. The bad guys who set it you know, died. And they got thrust in there because they wouldn't bow down to an idol. And before they did, they trash-talked biblically. And they said, we know our God is able to pull us out of this. We know he'll save us from this. But even if he doesn't, they understood God's sovereignty wasn't health, wealth, prosperity. They said, even in his sovereignty, if he chooses not to save us, we know he can and we will never bow down to your idols. We will always serve our God. God rewarded that faithfulness instantly by protecting him in the fire. And who was with them? Jesus. Jesus Christ was with them in the fire. There was a fourth figure in the fire. It was Jesus. He unbound their ropes. They came out unharmed, not even a, a scratch or a burn. Not even a little, a little boo-boo on their finger. They were unharmed because they had Jesus there with them. Where is Jesus in your life? Is Jesus the one you run to? Do you pray first before anything else? And do you come before God and you don't just say, God, thank you for this and help me with that. And help you don't just say something repetitively. You say, God, I'm, where are you? I'm struggling. Job asked God, where are you? What, how, why have you left me here? Why are you doing this? But he still stayed faithful. You are encouraged, not just allowed, you're encouraged to come before God and say, God, I don't understand what you're doing. Where are you? Where are you in this? 
But nevertheless, your will, not mine, be done. Jesus modeled that himself. He says, is there any other way? He was about to face brutal uh, beatings, flogging. They were going to beat him so bad in his face. The Bible says you couldn't even tell he was a man. That's how beat up and pulpy they made his face. They nailed nine, uh, however inch long nails into his, his hands, into his feet. They cursed him on a cross. They stuck him with a spear so that he would die quicker. Jesus knew that's what he was walking into. And he said, God, three times, read your Bible three times. He said, God, is there any other way? Do we have to do it this way? And immediately in the same breath, he said, but nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. Jesus, the son submitted to God the Father. Jesus is God. God submitted His own manifestation, the visible manifestation of the invisible Spirit God, came to earth and dwelt among us so that we could not be mistaken about what God can do and what He did on the cross. He said, is there any other way to do what? To atone for our sin, me and you. Is there any other way that we can allow your creation, our creation. The Bible says that everything was created through Jesus and for Jesus. Is there any other way that we can reconcile our creation back to us? Because I, this cup of suffering is, right? And, and he said, um, but nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. Three times. He was bleeding blood. I mean, sweating blood. Drops of blood is what looked like they were coming out of him when he was sweating. Read the Gospel of Luke when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane towards the end of his life. Well, the first end of his life. He's back, right? He came, he came back. We know that. But at the, his first physical death, first and only physical death, um, he was bleeding. He was sweating drops of blood. That must have been so intense that he was heading that way. But the point is this. Jesus, who knew that this was going to be what it took to reconcile his creation back to him in a loving act, the most loving act there ever was in existence and the most loving act there ever will be there is none greater than that in doing so we see the great love of our god for us because if you read your gospels study jesus study what he said and what he did and what he thought well how do i know what he thought because the bible tells us there are moments where it says jesus having compassion moved stirred moved in his heart moved with compassion felt for the people because he saw they were like sheep without a shepherd that's the jesus that we serve he was stirred in his heart to the point of weeping when he saw the people crying about lazarus his friend lazarus who had died days earlier he was stirred to the point of weeping when he saw that he wept over his people jerusalem how many times have i have I longed for you to come to me, to pull you into me as a, as a hen for her chicks? How many times I've wanted you to come back to me, but you refuse, you reject me. Jesus wept for us. He says we're like sheep without a shepherd before we come to him. But I want to tell you what's so important. Yes, it's wonderful to feel those things about Jesus, but what does it mean? It means we are without excuse because we have access to all the context of that perspective. What do I mean? I mean, because the Bible exists, we know why Jesus felt that compassion. We know that we have a choice to reject him or to receive him. And we know that if we allow him to be our teacher and to shepherd us, he will lead us to greener pastures. He will give us deliverance in our life on earth now. Maybe not everything. You might still have that sickness, that virus, that illness, that you know, inescapable, uh, you know, fatal disease or whatever, you know, I, I, that may not go away. You may have financial problems to the day you die, but Jesus will deliver in this lifetime, whatever he sees fit to deliver us from. And he will give us a hope and a joy in this life. No matter what circumstances are going on, we'll have a hope and a joy. That being the case, the greener pastures that God will lead us to is heaven eternity with god in a place of no crying no cancer no illness no death no pain no sorrow no um sin will be in heaven forever with god 
face to face as a man with a friend. That's what we have waiting for us. That's a greener pasture. And that's what we want. So the point is this. Don't ignore that message any longer. Don't delay. There's nothing to consider. This is the reality. This is the truth about life. This is your responsibility to make a decision for your eternal destination. This is what people lament for. Jeremiah the prophet lamented. He wrote a letter called Lamentations. Like Jeremiah lamented. He wept. He was called the weeping prophet. He wept because nobody was saved in his day according to what we can read from the Bible. It doesn't appear that anyone received Jeremiah's message. Nobody was saved in his time. He wept for the people. But it doesn't mean we stop trying. It doesn't mean we don't make sure you have the right information. The right information is found in the Bible, and it's a heavy book to understand. Get someone to help you walk through it. I do Bible studies almost every day. I've done the entire book of Acts. I'm on Genesis right now. I'm going to go through every single word that's in the Bible. I'm going to do it over the next 14 years. What I'm, God willing, that I live that long, right? What I'm trying to tell you is this. Get the information before you make a judgment call on your eternal destination. I love you guys. I'll be praying for you. It's in your best interest today to receive what Jesus Christ did on the cross and stop having a perception about it that's false. Stop rejecting the message because of people you've met in your past who did not represent properly what Christianity is. Forget about all that you think you know about it. Stop. Exercise humility and get into the Bible and just check. Is there anything here? Should I consider for a moment if this is true? Forget what you think you know about it if you have a rebellious nature towards Christianity. Forget what you think you know. We're a broken people. Someone or some amount of people, some church, some pastor, some reverend, some father, some congregation, some crazy guy in the street, somebody and collection of people may have completely turned you completely turned you away from the idea of who Jesus is. Don't let that stop you. You have a responsibility because I'm right here talking to you right now saying that that was false. That was misinformation. I'm here to give you truth. I don't stray from the Bible. This particular message I said in the beginning and I put it on my on my Facebook Live, you know, description. This is just an opinion, what I shared in this study today. It's, a, it's my opinion. This is not a biblical Bible study. It's an opinion. But all the rest of my studies are very clear that they're Bible studies. The Bible says to not withhold anything. It says to teach the full counsel of God. Every word in the Bible, like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, talking about things that are sin, that many people today don't want to hear it, that those things are sin. They think it's natural rather than sin. Nobody wants to hear that. If I speak the word of God, which I do, People turn the channel and swipe. They don't want to hear it. But that doesn't mean I'm ever going to stop. God willing, if I have breath in my lungs, I'm going to make sure anyone listening to this message knows the truth about who God is, what He did, and why He wants you with Him for eternity. It's all based on love. There's no hidden agenda from God. It's all based on love. He loves us so much that He fixed the problem that we created when we sinned in the Garden of Eden. That's the God that loves us. That's the God that's going to lead you to greener pastures to live in eternity with Him in a place of paradise. That's the God. Don't you want that peace? Don't you want that joy in your life? You can have a peace that surpasses all understanding in this life today. You don't have to wait until you get to heaven. You can have that peace that surpasses all understanding right now. It's in the Bible. The Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Focus only on the things that are admirable, true, trustworthy, pure, beautiful, loving. He says, focus on those things. And actually it says, fix your mind. Focus on what's real. Don't worry about what other people are saying. Don't worry about all the things that you know are wrong, but you just get so sucked in to the drama, to the gossip, to the problem. Forget about the problem and focus on what's real. Jesus Christ is pure love. He died on the cross so that you could have life eternal in heaven with him. That's what's real and true. 
There's a beautiful creation out there. The design of flowers and plant life and the cycle of, you know, um, what we call photosynthesis, right? And the, the whole idea of an atmosphere and the stars and the planets and, and, and the galaxies, you know, it's amazing. It's incredible. It's a beautiful design, childbirth. You don't even have to think consciously about what's happening inside you when the child is being born for all the women born, for all the women listening out there who have had a child. You don't even have to focus on, oh, I better form the eyes now, the eyelids, right? God is doing all that in your body. Your heart's beating without a battery. Your lungs are taking in air and blowing out uh, the carbon dioxide while you're sleeping. God is the one who is in control and he created everything. This is his world and it's time to stand up and stop living a lie. It's time to remove the veil that Satan puts over your eyes because that's what's true. Satan has the veil over your eyes if you don't believe. It's in the Bible. Satan blinds the eyes of the unbelievers. He's in your ear telling you falsities and you're buying it. Don't you want truth? Don't you want to stop believing a lie? I know you do. Nobody wants to be living in a lie that they know is a flat-out lie for someone who has their destruction in mind. Satan wants to destroy you. He came to seek, kill, and destroy. I'm, I'm sorry, to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan is the father of all lies. He did not come to say, I'll share my kingdom with you. No, he came to drag you into hell with him. Jesus came not to condemn you or punish you, but to save you. That's what Jesus really came for. Not to tell you how bad of a person you are, how wrong you are. It's not like that. For all the Catholic people who tell me, oh, I used to be Catholic. I used to go to a Catholic church. My parents were Catholic, my grandparents. And you have just this false understanding of of who Christ is. Guys, it's time to let go of that. You were told lies. You were told incorrect information. I'm not saying all Catholicism is a lie. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is the people who have turned away from the faith because they say, oh, you know, I was Catholic, but I don't want that. I want a punishing God. I'll tell you one thing. Catholic people are worshiping idols and saints. They shouldn't be worshiping saints or idols or the Virgin Mary. You worship God only. It's what the Bible says. But the point is this. You were led the wrong way. Stop letting that be your story. I don't care. That's, that's not who you are today. Am I going to walk around and say, well, when I was younger, I believed this, so I better just keep living this lie? Of course not. When I'm privy to the truth, I'm going to stop living that other way because I don't want to live a lie. If you want to continue to live a lie because you don't want to change, that's your fault. And it's your responsibility to make that change. But if you're willing to humble yourself, open your mind and say, forget everything I think I know about Christianity. Let me listen to this guy, Eli. Let me find somebody whose voice you hear. Let me hear somebody tell the truth about the word of God. It doesn't make me commendable or or, or honorable or deserve a medal. I'm not puffing myself up to say, listen to me. I'm saying, listen to me because I'm telling you what's in the Bible. I'm begging you. I'm urging you. Listen to what I'm saying because it's from the Bible. It's the true word of God. It has nothing to do with me. I'm just willing. Do you understand? I'm just willing to speak the truth. That's the only thing commendable or honorable about me is that I'm willing Are you willing? Are you? Are you willing to throw aside what you think you know and just give it a try? Just listen and read the Bible and say, help me. Someone help me understand what this is saying. I don't know how Adam could be 930 years old. I didn't either. When I first read Genesis, it didn't make sense to me. It sounded like a fairy tale, like a story. Somebody just made it up. It sounded good. But if we look at this world when it was first created, think about the quality of the air and the quality of the produce and the vegetables and everything. You're you're not going to tell me with all the pollution now, right, with all the diseases and illnesses, in the beginning there was no disease or illness. Of course Adam could live 930 years. The place was paradise. It was perfect. Of course that can be true. But are you willing to hear that? If not, I'm so sorry, but your destination is not heaven. If I don't say it, I'm not loving you. I'm not giving you love if I don't tell you the truth. This is what you have to do. you got to take Christ in your heart or you are not going to heaven. 
He is the only way. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and none can come to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus' claim was. That's the claim I stand on. It doesn't say Jesus said, I am a way, a truth, and a life. He said, I am the way, the only way. None can come to the Father except through me. That means any other religion outside of what Christ said and did and what we need to receive will not lead you to a place of eternal paradise. It will lead you to a place of eternal torment in the lake of fire, day and night. Listen to the truth found in the Bible and take a decision with the right information. You're being fooled. If you're rebelling against Christ, you've been fooled. You're being played like a sucker by the devil. If you are rebelling against the notion of Jesus or Christianity, you're you're being played by by Satan. If you want to be played, I'm sorry to hear that. I don't. I choose not to be played by Satan anymore. I choose to let God say, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into my presence. I want you to do the same. It's my hope for you. Thank you, guys. In Jesus' name, have a wonderful day.